Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to our viewers in South Africa and Mauritius. Good afternoon to our friends in Sydney and Singapore, and especially thanks to our guests from the UK for making an early start today. As we draw to the end of a hectic 2021 and start planning ahead for the coming year, I'm excited to welcome you to our informative session today, where we ask the question, how will digital asset innovation impact the future of your banking and investments. We would like to thank Stewart Investment Capital and RL Technology for sponsoring this event. We would also like to thank Sunlam and Investec, our strategic partners of the Chamber, for their ongoing support and guidance. Almost a decade ago, when the Bitcoin price was still around $100, was the first time I ever took notice of this abstract and seemingly off piece techie gaming toy, which people told me was called Bitcoin. I dismissed advice to learn more and thought it was way beyond my understanding as a CA to try and figure out what blockchain coding protocols were all about and what hash rates and mining meant. Years passed by, and when Bitcoin grew past about $3,000, I saw a tweet from JP Morgan staff at the conference brainstorming the future of Bitcoin. While their CEO at the same time dismissed the digital asset class completely. This was the first time that I got interested and got, allocate, and got allocated when my good friend, Nick Allen, helped me up to set my first wallet and gave me my very first Bitcoin. When Bitcoin was about $10,000, we set out to build the first proprietary blockchain software company in Mauritius from scratch and pulled together top resources from various parts of the world to build the tech. When Bitcoin was about $15,000, we, start, we launched digital asset products within Steward Investment Capital and took the digital asset investment class to a select market of sophisticated investors. By the time Bitcoin hit $30,000, we had launched four innovative digital asset products across South Africa, USA, Australia, and Mauritius. From humble, be from humble beginnings to trading in excess of $100 million per month. And now with Bitcoin passing $60,000, we have set up a further two fully regulated US hedge funds. And, and so in the interest of disclosing my subjectivity in today's presentation, uh, you guys know me well as the president of the SA Chamber, uh, but I also serve as the CEO of Stewards Investment Capital and the chairman of RL Technology. Um, so to, dis to dis disclose up from my subjectivity in the presentation. And I guess you guys also know where I spend my time and I'm not trying to crack corny jokes at the chamber. So to today's topic, uh, 2021 has sparked the institutionalization of digital assets initiated by Elon Musk's allocations to Bitcoin at the beginning of this year, which have, come, uh, which have culminated in the recent supportive SEC regulation for Bitcoin ETFs, sending the asset class to a new record high in the past few days. Digital assets, now represent a market cap of about 2.5 trillion. Uh, I think I need to be fact-checked today. Maybe it was 2.5 trillion last week. Um, but uh, with, the, with the leading investments from uh, people like Facebook, PayPal, Twitter, Microsoft, Visa, JP Morgan, Banco Santander, Arc Investments, uh, Guggenheim Investments, and many more. The SHM of Commerce is pleased to offer information from industry experts today about how digital assets are innovating traditional finance, and especially in the areas of banking, securitization, insurance, and investment management. Of course, there are lots of exciting investment opportunities. So that's about it from me. So for today, to introduce the, the format of uh, our presentation, uh, we'll hear 10 minutes of a presentation from each of the speakers. Uh, which should get us, it's about 10 past 10 now, so that should get us to around 11 o'clock. Uh, and then we'll open for Q&A panel session, which is what this is all about. And uh, we welcome your questions, which you can send us in the comments box or in the Q&A. Um, and then uh, our, our panel will, uh, will uh, debate some of the, the ideas that you put out and also help to answer your questions. Uh, I see that the invite's gone out for two and a half hours. We'll aim to be done in 90 minutes. Um, and then we can stay on if there are further questions, but uh, we should be done by 11.30 Mauritius time, 9.30 South Africa time. So please use the comment box uh, or the Q&A box to start sending to your questions. 
Uh, to kick off, I'd like to present our first speaker for today is Jevin Coffin Gray. Jevin advises the Investment Committee of the Spectrum Digital Asset Portfolio. He is an electronic engineer with over 18 years of experience in developing cutting edge commercial products for heavy data dependent environments. Before joining Avanco, he led a team of engineers at PFK Electronics to develop Internet of Things solutions. He's one of the early adopters of blockchain technology, having been active in the space since the early days. Jevin holds a BSc in, in electronic engineering and is an integral part of the design and development of the asset management software powering Spectrum. Jevin has also published interesting articles on various aspects of digital asset infrastructure. Most recently, his inter interesting article on Solana. Jevin has an amazing ability to take a very complex concept and break it down into first principles in a way that even I have been able to understand and I still can't get my emails to work properly. So, so uh, without, uh, without much delay, Jevin, um, do you wanna throw on your presentation? Let me hand over to you. Sure, will do. It's confirmed, Lal, you can see my presentation? Perfect, that looks great, well done. Great, you thanks. You definitely know how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> it's a great start when you can start your presentation with a working slideshow. Thanks for the introduction, Lil. And um, yeah, so I'm from Avancore, and Avancore specializes in developing fintech solutions within the digital asset space. As Bilal mentioned, yeah, 18 years experience within tech. Um, main focuses have been IoT, reg tech, and, and fintech. But we're not here to hear much about me. I mean, and Bilal's uh, made sure I've only got 10 minutes to talk, so let's get on with this, and let's talk about the more exciting stuff for blockchain and the innovation within the space. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is a database, a distributed one, one that is tamper resistant because of cryptography. And in the case of Bitcoin, this database is a ledger that stores transactions. And you have miners that are distributed around the world that are taking transactions and validating them. And then when consensus adding that transaction to this ledger. So let's look at a basic flow. Person A wants to send money to person B. They submit a transaction and that transaction then is broadcast to everyone on the network. These miners, and just to be clear, miners are computers, not small children, are validating these transactions. And when consensus is met that this transaction is valid, adding this transaction to the blockchain. And that point, person B receives the money from person A. So let's have a look into the tr traditional space. I'd actually just like to first focus on actually the transfer of information across networks, across the internet. And when you send a file across the internet or any information, you're actually sending a copy of that information. Now with money, you can't send a copy. If I send money to person A, I can't send that same money to person B. It's a fairly important criteria to money. And this is the double spend problem. And today we rely on banking institutions and other intermediaries like uh, credit card providers and governments to handle this for us. An issue is that they're centralized and this makes them prone to hacking as many have found out. Um, it's also uh, creates exclusion, high transaction costs, long settlement times. The blockchain has actually found a solution to this. So instead of this elaborate system of infrastructure created here, we have a system where the double spend problem is fixed and this infrastructure is no longer required. So this lowers costs, of course, and makes transactions faster. So we essentially have payments now that are cheaper and faster. And one area that is greatly um, benefited from this is remittance. So just looking at a bit of data, according to the World Bank, last year, 2020, $702 billion was remitted globally. $540 billion of that was uh, remitted to low and middle income countries. Let's have a look at costs. 
the average cost of remittance globally is 6.38%. And in South Africa, it's over 15. So that is a significant amount of value of remittance going to in intermediaries. Unfortunately, we, we do have quite a bit of experience with developing remittance solutions using digital assets for our partners. And our data shows that we can settle this within minutes and also just for a few pips. Even when we start to include the on and off ramps from, from fiat systems on either side of this particular infographic. So that's just payments and transactions over the blockchain. But let's, let's look into some more elaborate mechanisms within blockchain. And I'm sure everyone has heard the term smart contracts. So what is a smart contract? Well, a smart contract is just self-executing code. And when included in a blockchain, inherits the attributes of being tamper-proof. So rather than focus on the detail of it now, let's actually go into an example I think it'll make more sense. An example that I'd like to focus on is with the financial services. And I'm sure Nathaniel later will uh, go on a, a few more applications that are very relevant to our viewers today. But I'd like to focus on insurance, simply because the, the concept can be easily explained here. And insurance is a place where we're starting to find adoption with smart contracts. So really, what is insurance? Insurance is we have party A has identified a risk and party B, which is happy to take on that risk and pay out to party A if that event occurs. Obviously, if they get a premium in return. And party B is happy to do this because they can pool the risk. So if we look at a more specific example, um, and one which I've been involved in is flight insurance. So flight insurance we can do in a small contract. And how this would work is that I would provide my flight details to the small contract application. And that small contract would then get information from an oracle on the flight's information. So an oracle is just an independent, trusted source of information. So the Oracle is providing just flight information continuously to this smart contract. And the smart contract is just executing business logic to determine whether the payout needs to go to the insured. Is that that same Oracle from the matrix? Yeah, it, it, it'll look pretty similar, but a little bit more sophisticated and hopefully more automated. And um, some of the benefits of this is that it's automated the rules are defined and tamper-proof. There is now transparency there. Um, and there's little overhead. And just to go to the quickly touch on the point of transparency, I looked at a little bit of stats, and these are stats for, to get on the USA, unfortunately, you couldn't get for here. But in the USA, 43% of people who took the survey um, said that they do not trust insurance companies. Showing just the benefit of just having transparency for adoption and tr insurance. But a great benefit here is obviously the, the lesser overhead. Now, this is a very simple insurance uh, concept, but I'm sure that we can start to, off these building blocks, build more complex insurance products and use a whole bunch of other mechanisms within blockchain to, to build these, these solutions. Things like uh, decentralized governments to assist with uh, decision-making. And, all, and a host of other applications to help with risk assessment of user, users. So we can start to automate a lot of the processes and have transparency there. So with this efficiency, smart contracts starts to make sense for insurance. And where things make economic sense, uh, sense we tend to find innovation and then adoption. So this is starting to bring me to the end of my, my presentation, but there's one other aspect I'd like to just touch on about smart contracts, and that is value. So coming back to the internet and consider where the value lies in the internet, and the value lies in the application layer. So we think Google, Facebook, Amazon, host of companies that you can see huge value in. But with the internet, there is very little value in this protocol layer. So the internet wouldn't work today without something called TCP. And TCP is what enables the internet to work. But what TCP has failed to do is capture value. 
But let's look at smart contract platforms and Ethereum is a, is a good case. If you want to use Ethereum and build applications in Ethereum and have them run, you need Ethereum to pay for the cost of using the application. So the price of Ethereum is inextricably linked to the use and growth and adoption of platforms on Ethereum. So what Ethereum and other small contracts have been able to do is actually capture value at the protocol layer. So let's take this back to the internet and consider that in the early days of the internet in the 90s, imagine you were able to capture some of that value and then consider what that value would be worth today. So that is it for me um, today. Thank you for having me present. And Bilal, I'll hand Thank you very much. over to you. Well done, Jeff. No, that was very interesting. I mean, uh, I've heard people say that they would have loved to buy the internet or they think they own the internet. Um, you know, in the, in the past decade, we've heard uh, a lot of those funny comments. And if, if we look at um, Ethereum as a, as a protocol and assimilate it to a gym membership, uh, or a golf club membership. Um, it's effectively like you've got a, a golf course which has, can have 100 members. Um, and the more people that want to play on that golf course, the more that membership to use that golf course goes up in value. And as that Ethereum protocol um, uh, starts to become more widespread as the, the, the dominant um, blockchain protocol, uh, the value of those coins definitely uh, go up in terms of how you use it. Also, I found it very interesting what you were saying about um, uh, the insurance, and I think it links well with what you were saying about the Internet of Things in your in your PFK days. Um, imagine a world where your car has a microchip that says um, I've uh, I've knocked into a light pole, and the blockchain then confirms that this car has knocked into a light pole, which it, which talks into your blockchain-based insurance contract, which triggers your insurance payment without you even having to to fill out a form by the time you get home, um, it's been independently verified whether or not you actually have had an accident. And if you actually, be Bilal, you can take that a layer even deeper. So imagine every single part of your car, the wheels, the rims, the, uh, the, the roof, everything has a smart IoT device. And whenever these IoT device in these specific parts gets like smashed, which means there's been an accident. So what happens is, they quantify the amount of IoT parts that have been smashed. And then these, using the Oracle, get transferred to a blockchain saying like these parts have been damaged. And without even having to go to like um, a surveyor, you get your payout immediately because the cost of, uh, of reparation and damages has already been assessed. So it's like Amazing. you dock your car and you get like an SMS like two seconds later, okay, here's $5,000. These are the damages that, that you have incurred. Yeah. Amazing. And it saves your time as an uh, as a insured client and it also saves the time of the insurer and the fraud risk of people lying about what actually was damaged in the car. Um, yeah, amazing. And, and, and also that that information that is coming to those insurance products, obviously that we have to we have to rely on the source of information. But the source of information, if you manage to automate that, is through code. And there are mechanisms with or ways to do this with blockchain to actually verify code. This has tremendous application all over the place. If you think about how do we verify that that automated car providers are writing their code that conforms to some regulation around how AI needs to work. Like how do you, how do we make decisions? It takes the decision-making off the people writing the code. So like if there's an accident, who do you sue for the way that your AI worked? Well, as long as it conforms to how the regulatory body determines how your AI should be running, then you're safe. And that's, that conformity can be checked via blockchain. Amazing, amazing stuff. And then on, on the payment side, in terms of remittance, um, you mentioned it takes a very long time to move a payment from one geography to another, because if I'm paying from my Investec bank account in Mauritius to my, even my Investec bank account in the UK, that's gonna go through Wells Fargo and Citibank correspondent banking, SWIFT systems, confirmations. Um, you know, everybody takes their time and their share of the fees and it costs you $50 in soft cost just to do that. Whereas in the blockchain, you'd be able to move directly from party A to party B without any intermediary, which is, a, I mean, a big word is disintermediation. And what that actually means is just cutting off all the delays and costs of all the middlemen in between and reducing the cost of these global remittances. 
But uh, yes. the one thing I didn't like about what you said, Jeb, is that uh, people won't be able to double, double spend anymore. Um, so, for, so for those people that think they can spend uh, money on their bank card and their credit card, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So look, they, they can't double spend, but they'll save in transaction yeah. fees. Fantastic. No, cool, man. Okay, so so thanks very much, Jeb. Let's uh, let's um, listen to Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel leads quantitative and fundamental uh, research at uh, Spectrum Digital Asset uh, Portfolio. He's a derivative, ex-derivative trader and investment analyst who transitioned into the digital asset space in 2017. He has a thorough knowledge of digital assets from both the financial and technical perspective, having worked for a digital asset firm as a head of finance and product development. Nathaniel has a first degree in mathematics uh, from Queen Mary University and a second law degree from BPP Law School. He's also no stranger to the blockchain stage and has presented across Asia, Middle East, and even to over 10,000 people at the O2 Arena in the UK. He usually has his thick rims, um, dark glasses, and a bow tie, uh, but I think he tried to reduce his quant look for today. Uh, and you may also often see him looking like a red panda NFT or wearing VR goggled crypto punks, um, which are all these different personas. So, so Nathaniel, um, welcome and please share your presentation. Hi, so, so thank you, uh, Bilal, for the warm welcome. So I'm here to take you deeper down the rabbit hole. So, I mean, this is Wonderland. And I think there's no better way to learn about what it is than just to dive deep inside. So um, the first thing I'd like to, to start with is the whole concept of what we call ownership, okay? So ownership is, is as old as time itself, you know, like back to the cavemen when they used to own their clubs, their caves, and their rugs of, of like uh, mammoth skin, you know? And over time it has evolved and ownership kind of transition into law where uh, you'd say I own something and the law or whoever represents the law would, would protect you and say, yeah, you definitely own that. But going into the 21st century, ownership is um, transition from law and going to like more specific. And it goes into like, let's call it a more concrete proof of, of what you own. So taking uh, the items I've listed uh, on, on the slide as example, so let's say um, you have a Van Gogh, Van Gogh painting, okay? So what proves that you'll be owner of that Van Gogh painting? Uh, most likely it's the Christie's receipt from, from buying it at the auction. But apart from that, you know, nobody can say, no, it's mine, it's mine. No, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to find out. I mean, how would you say you own your house? I mean, there's usually in countries central registry, which allocates names to the houses and says, okay, this house is mine, I can prove it. Uh, same thing for cars. Uh, when we go into stocks, bonds, equities, financial instruments, usually the only way you can prove that is because you have a brokerage account and the broker says, yeah, that guy own it, owns it. And, and this is a very, very important concept because when trying to prove ownership to anyone, you always have to move and go to those agents, this representative that hold the centralized ledger that says who owns what. And this can be a problem in this modern world in evaluating what you own, because let's, let's, let's look at it the other way. If I don't know what I own and I can't prove it to somebody else, it's very difficult for me to draw value against that or to process a transaction. So this is why we're going to touch um, the first layer down the rabbit hole is tokenization of real assets. So tokenization of real assets is when we try to inscribe the ownership of those assets onto a blockchain. And the reason we do that is very simple, okay? So if I have a car, I have a house, I have uh, stocks, and let's say tomorrow I need liquidity. And the only way for me to be able to draw that liquidity, I mean, if you ever taken um, a mortgage against, uh, against your house and, and try to go to the bank, it's like, it takes like three months. And the bank, bank is going to charge you an arm and a leg for that. Same thing for a car, uh, same thing for stocks. I mean, it's, it's complicated, it takes time and it's costly. So when we're talking about tokenization, we're talking about taking those ownerships, those receipts, those proof of ownership, handing them over to a custodian. For example, uh, that could be Deutsche Bank or any of those uh, custodians. Well, right now they're not doing that, 
but trust me, in two years, they'll be doing that. And they'll be issuing you on the blockchain an NFT, which is um, what we call a, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in layman form, it's a non-fungible token or like a unique digital proof of receipt. And that digital proof of receipt is sent to you onto your wallet, into your ownership. And in your wallet, you can see like, for example, in this case, three tokens. One token says, I have this car and I have this house and I have this stock, okay? So this is the first step. And this is very important because when we go to the second step, which is where the real business uh, is drummed up, is collateralized lending. So from the moment you have those digitalized uh, ownership tokens, okay, what you can do is you can actually draw value against that. So if tomorrow, and this is actually being done today, so it's not something which is in the hypothetical scenario. It is something which is actually being done for a post year. So people have started digitalizing their assets and they lock it in a smart contract. And using the same principle that we were touching before, like with insurance, so we have an oracle. So in the case of, uh, let's call it um, a house, okay? So I have my house NFT, which I got from um, the custodian by depositing the ownership with a custodian. So I take this house NFT, I put in a contract and that contract is functions like an escrow account. And that escrow account has two purposes. Number one is it connects to an Oracle, which most likely in this particular case is going to connect to like a series of housing agents that's gonna tell me how much approximately this house is worth on a live basis, not on a monthly or yearly basis, but on a instantaneous basis. You know, if tomorrow somebody comes and buys all the house in the neighborhood and send the prices 50%, 100% up, the Oracle will see that immediately because it's pricing from all the transactions happening uh, from the agents that give them the information and he updates it on the contract. So he's gonna say, for example, your house is worth uh, after that mad rush, $2 million. So using this escrow account, you can actually go to a lender and that lender can see in real time how much the ask is worth. And the ownership token, which is, um, has been derived from a custodian is inside this contract. So the lender can say, okay, I'm gonna give you, let's call it uh, a loan, 50% uh, against the value of your asset. So $2 million, 50% that's $1 million and you get it immediately. And you don't even need to ask me like by filing forms or anything because the lender is a robot. You know, it's not even a, a, a human being assessing whether uh, what's the price of a house because it doesn't need to because the Oracle already determines the high price of a house. So you tokenize all your assets and whenever, whenever you need value, you just drop it inside the escrow account, which is going to be an automated program and then you draw money against that lender. And that lender usually takes the form of a pool. So it's kind of like a, a big fund, like a bank, if you want, that, that puts money aside to serve the uh, borrower's demand. And this you can draw from this pool by a click of a button. So right now, if I put my assets on the blockchain and I want to draw value, it takes me, depending on the blockchain, like one to two seconds. And on some platform, I can draw up to 90% of the value. And the lender doesn't care about what I'm going to do with the money because from the moment the asset goes close to the liquidation price or, or near underwater, it sees the asset and immediately sell it. So the lender has no risk and the lender is a robot. So he doesn't need to, to, to go through a process of, of talking to people. And you as an investor, if you draw that money and you decide to take that $1 million and buy Bitcoin <laughs> and somewhere, overnight that $1 million turns into $2 million, you can just repay that whole thing again within one second and you'd pay the ongoing interest rates. So maybe in that case of lending platform, um, you'd pay like maybe like three or 4% annualized. So the whole process of drawing assets, drawing value from assets has been automated. And in this whole system, you have only one human being, which is the investor, the owner. The Oracle is automated. The escrow is automated. It's a contract on the blockchain. The lender is a counterparty program that provides funds on the blockchain. So this is collateralized lending. And this is one of the most interesting innovation that's happening in the space. And it's, gonna, it's coming really, really fast. So I don't know whether you think this is um, 
This is far fetched, but like I said, this is already happening in terms of collateralized lending. I think the value that is being drawn on a daily basis should be around like um, half to like, no, no, it should be around, yeah, make it like five, 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 uh, five to 20 billion on a daily basis, dollars actively. It's, it's a very small market relative to the, to the banking system, but it's growing. I mean, one year ago it was zero. <laughs> So from zero to $20 million in the span of like 12 months, it's a big progress. And we are forecasting even higher growth inside the sector. So the other concept, so now we're already down the rabbit hole, is what are bankers going to look like? So we all know the traditional bankers. My wife is a banker. I know how she looks like. Like the costume uh, with a suit and tie. Please going... don't tell me that's a picture of your wife, Nathaniel. <laughs> it's not, it's not. But... Uh, <laughs> I, I use this picture because um, this is uh, which the bankers as we know it, the stereotypical banker, the guy in a suit uh, telling you, reading documents, you submit a, your loan application, he answers you after three months if he's happy about it, when he asks you for 200% cash collateral. <laughs> I mean, this is the old bankers. And we are having, what we're having uh, right now is a new generation of bankers. So I call them um, coding bankers because they're creating banks, they're creating investment banks, they're creating insurance companies, they're creating everything that you have in the final system, but even better, even faster and automated. And they are all doing that from their house wearing pants. No, not, not even wearing pants, just in their underwear. And this is um, what the guys were looking at. And what we have been doing- That guy looks like anonymous. Yeah, but yeah, guys looks like you. me when I'm not wearing a suit. <laughs> or like Jervin when he's not wearing a suit. But what makes it interesting is um, I'm going to walk you through, through something uh, which, which I really hold dear. And it's one of the oldest financialization uh, process that has been ha happening on the blockchain and it's securitization. Okay. So I think uh, even though you're, you're not investment bankers, okay, you know it's not easy to have something securitized. For example, let's say if tomorrow I wanted to create my company, uh, list the shares on a stock exchange and raise money from investors, um, just remaining on the private side and knocking doors, it would take me like a boatload of money and a lot of time. I would need an accountant, an investment banker, an investment advisor, and a lot of money. So, so it's very complicated. And I'm not even talking about getting the stock of my new company listed on the stock exchange, <laughs> which is even more complicated. But this whole process, I can do that in five minutes for $5. So I can create tokens representing shell my company. It takes me about to compile the data two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, copy paste, click compile, five minutes in gas fee. Uh, investors, I can drop that contract code onto any WhatsApp group, Facebook chat, and they know they can invest in my company. They can just send money to the contract and they get the shares in return. And right after they finish buying those tokens representing shares in my company, I can list them into a decentralized exchange. And that again takes about one and a half minute. So I can do right now on, in the crypto space and on using blockchain, what the bankers, investment bankers would charge you like probably like half a million dollar to $2.5 million and three months. So, this kind of value creation creates like a, a mad kind of uh, free market style. This is, this is the free market as free as can be. Anybody can create something, list it, sell it, and let the price be governed by the free market. So we have a security- capital raising ability is, uh, is free yeah. of uh, <laughs> currency as well. Because you um, can be in any, any geography. It can, it's free of geography and it's free of currency in the sense that you could come with uh, digital Indian rupiah, you could come with Mauritian rupee, you could come with dollars, you could come with dog coins. It doesn't matter because from the moment the tokens go into a smart contract, I can have them swap for whatever reserved uh, currency that I want. So people could be putting doggy coin inside and to buy my equity, but from the moment that Doggy Coin touches my contract, it is swapped automatically into dollars. So it, they could actually even use their house NFT, which I discussed previously, 
to buy into that uh, in, into that uh, that auction. And we're not talking about just like simple offering. We have like whole bunch of auction type which is already commercialized, like bash auctions, Dutch auctions, um, any kind of auctions that already exist in the treasury system. You can implement that inside that contract. And like I said, you. I would like to say that you need like a high level of, of technical ability to do that, but no. I mean, this year has we have seen commercialization of these products where you can just go onto a platform that actually offers a service. Of course, you'd pay more than five dollars to get this done, like probably like pay hundred dollars to this platform. But still, it's cheaper than paying like uh, two point five million dollars to an investment bank. So, with securitization of real assets securitization of security, securitization of basically anything that you think that can have value can be securitized. So this leads us into the final innovation, which is the lending pool. So the lending pool is how um, the guys on the, in the crypto space are planning to kill banks. <laughs> so, which is very interesting. I mean, the whole process of banking, I mean, the core banking, I'm not going to go into fractional banking, but I'm just gonna to touch basic like banking from 100 years ago. So there was a lending. So traditional banking from 100 years ago, you'd come with like um, your 100 shekels and it's always like silver dollar and you deposit them at the bank. The bank says, hmm, thank you for your $100, uh, 100 silver dollars. In one year you come back, I'm going to give you $100 back and two additional dollars as interest. As the deposit says, thank you, I'll come back in one year. And what the bank does is goes to see people say, you guys need to borrow silver dollars? Okay, I'll lend you hundred silver dollars, but you pay me $10 as interest, 10 silver dollars. So they make the spread of 8%. So the whole borrowing and lending and how your interest is repaid depends on the ability of a banker to go door to door, to call those people and find somebody who's going to take a loan. So if a banker doesn't manage to take the loan, technically they're going in the water because they can't pay your interest. So how this happens in, in banking 2.0 when we're talking about the, um, uh, the lending pool is, let's say I have um, digital dollars, okay? So I deposit those digital dollars, $100 inside the lending pool and anyone who has collateral, digital collateral can come and says, hey, I wanna borrow $10, I wanna borrow $50, I wanna borrow like $8, doesn't matter. And I wanna repay it whenever I want. So you remove a middleman. And the protocol takes like a, a modicum fee, like barely like um, half a percent of, of whatever is being uh, borrowed out. And the advantage is the rate that you get in terms of interest on your deposit determ is determined by the borrowers. So if a lot of people borrow from the, the, the lending pool, the first thing is the rate of interest goes up because the more you borrow, that means the more there is demand for the asset, the higher you get paid. So if theoretically I put my 100 digital dollars inside that pool and 80 of them get, gets borrowed, so I could be getting, uh, borrowers could be paying like 15% because the asset is demand. But if there's only like 10% of, of the assets being in demand, then you, they pay less. So what it creates is it creates a bonding curve that prevents people from borrowing more than what it is available. So it is a really far-fetched from fractional banking, but it works. And the advantage is you can be very transparent in knowing what your asset is giving you back. Because if you go into the lending pool, you know exactly how many people have borrowed against it and how much interest you will get. And this is banking 2.0. And again, this all happens without human beings. The only human beings is the lender and the borrower in this equation. And, and <laughs> In some extreme, well, not the extreme case scenario, the lender and the borrower themselves are, are, are robots. So the lender is, for example, an investment manager trying to deposit assets across pools to get the best return. And the borrower is, for example, um, a financing company trying to draw value or even like a retail investor trying to, to, to take a loan against his house to, to be able to, like say, uh, buy something or, or pay for a trip. So these type of innovations are, are coming. Well, they already come, they're already here. It's just a matter of how fast we're going to take over the banking system. But like I said, from zero being deposited, uh, deposited inside these things to over 20 billion being used on, on a daily basis uh, in, in the span of 12 months, that's a big thing. And we're not seeing any, any deceleration on that side. 
So yeah, so that, that's it for, for me. Um, Excellent, I'll Daniel. Hand over to Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. So it sounds like from a banking perspective, the concept of Lombard lending, where you played your shares and you borrow uh, money against your asset uh, at a bank, uh, could really be threatened by decentralized borrowing platforms where you can pledge a wrapped version of a, of a share or any other asset. And then from a second perspective, uh, if you wanted to raise money to buy your, your home, um, you could actually in the future own your home uh, on a registry, which is in the blockchain, which is going to confirm that you own that house. And then from that registry or to prove the ownership of your house without any notaries or lawyers, uh, you'll be able to move your asset into a pledged collateral uh, uh, protocol where then you can borrow from the lending protocol without a bank. Um, so the ability to then apply for a home loan becomes um, almost uh, automatic without people. Um, so, so very interesting stuff. And, and then what you're saying about the, the uh, capital raising side where people go to corporate finance companies to to connect you, to connect the idea with the uh, with the funds, that's amazing. So, so now, when you use a token to raise capital, um, there's already a trust between the investor and the recipient company, where you don't need a uh, an escrow in the middle to uh, to collect the money and prove um, you know that it is actually going to to the person that that um, it intended to go to. Um, I think there will be a lot of regulation coming in that space um, to protect investors because it is a bit of the wild west, but the technology definitely exists now. So yeah, thank you, Nathaniel. Very, very interesting. Uh, guys, we're doing okay for time. Um, uh, so I'm going to now, uh, we may be five minutes over, but, but that's okay. Um, I want to introduce uh, Graham. Uh, Graham is the CIO of the Spectrum Digital Asset Portfolio. Um, and he's got the valuable ability to blend both traditional and digital asset investment theories. Uh, Graham's got over a decade of investment management and financial advisory experience. Uh, he has a deep understanding of the traditional finance market and obviously the nascent digital asset space. He holds a chartered alternative investment analyst designation and a BCom in economics and a postgraduate diploma in financial planning. Uh, Graham is well respected as a leader in crypto communities. Uh, he's presented at various conferences, including uh, Crypto Fest, where I think uh, ladies and even some men were throwing their socks at him in admiration on the stage. Um, but uh, a very, very engaging speaker and uh, uh, an another, uh, another uh, person who has the ability to take a very complex idea and break it down into something that's very understandable. So, uh, Graham, I hand over to you. Great, thank you, Bilal, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, yeah, so I, th I think Nathaniel and uh, Jevin did a great job in laying the foundation and the platform for um, hopefully great understanding about what's happening in the space and some of the exciting technology applications, de developments, etc. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not a programmer, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not going to be you know, that guy sitting in the with the hoodie you know, coding up these new uh, platforms and new products. But uh, what I can do is allocate capital uh, strategically to obviously generate a return. So that's what I want to take you through today is you know, how um, one can look at allocating um, capital in a space and give you some insights into the investment environment of the digital asset space. So just a, a quick overview of the digital asset marketplace. Um, as a, yeah, let, let's call it its own asset class now. Um, looking at the market cap, it's um, at around $2.6 trillion. Um, it's a highly liquid um, marketplace where you can now move large amounts of capital uh, within the system. Um, Bitcoin still is the biggest player in the space. Um, it's the most recognizable. It's really the guard market. Um, so it still holds the majority um, chunk. But as you'll see, as we go through Bitcoin is definitely not the only kid on the block. And we've chatted on Ethereum, but there's a whole lot of new exciting projects um, coming into the space, which are, are demanding our attention as investors. Um, and then lastly, Bitcoin is now 12 years old. So it's no longer um, uh, you know, this, this new technology with an unknown quantity. Um, it's definitely got a, a decent track record behind it. And 
I think it's um, you know, high time we start looking at taking this asset class seriously. Um, and for me, you know, there is no asset class on earth that is as exciting as an investment proposition as digital assets. Um, and here you can see the size of it, you know, 2.6 trillion. So it's now big enough for institutions to um, access this asset class. You know, for a long time, uh, institutions looking at the space said, look, it's still too small. Um, it's, it's, it's made up of, of geeks and, and retail traders. But you know, now with this market cap and what we've seen through the developments of regulation and adoption in the last 12 months, um, we've, we've seen a massive uptick in appetite of institutions. And you know, we can call this, I, I think the last 12 months, essentially the, the, in, the institutionalization of cryptocurrency um, and digital assets, which is obviously extremely exciting for those that have been um, in this space for a little while. Um, but at the same time, despite um, you know, the growth in the space, it's still got a tremendous um, path ahead. You know, so if you look at fixed income and, and, and equities as traditional asset classes, um, digital assets are still a very small percentage of, um, of total value that um, exists in the world. Um, and I think one of the common things that you hear from people is saying, well, like Mr. Boat, you know, if I was buying Bitcoin 10 years ago, that would have, that would have been great, but um, you know, it's too late now. Um, so I think you know, to put that in perspective, we are all familiar with the dot-com bubble story in the 2000s. Um, and obviously we're gonna go through boom and bust cycles with any, like, like uh, the market of any new technology. But um, you know, in the year 2000, had you bought Amazon and Google and a couple other of those tech companies, you'd be in a very good position. So um, you know, 20 years later, um, that, that's an asset class uh, in terms of the internet and tech, which has served investors very well. And I expect that digital assets will do something similar um, despite you know, temporary um, over and under valuations of the asset class um, over time. Um, I'd like to add something on, on the previous slide, uh, going, back, going back. Um, so you look at a small red dot, don't look at it as become like a bigger circle. So you should look at it as all the fixed income, all the equity, all the gold and all the oil, all the finance, all the big tech, everything being like um, digitalized and filling up that red circle. So when we're looking us at, uh, from our perspective on a 10 year down the line um, um, objective, we're not looking at 2.6 trillion becoming like 50 trillion. We're looking at that small red circle absorbing the blue circle, the yellow circle and everything else. So this is um, what we need to look when, uh, when we're looking at growth over the next 10 years. Yeah, 100%. So um, the phrase software is eating the world comes to mind. So that was a big phrase uh, a couple of years ago. And I think a similar phrase could be pointed towards digital assets where digital assets can, are, are potentially going to be eating the world and eating value uh, in, in time as it matures and develops. And I think the question is, is fast changing from should I hold digital assets or cryptocurrency in my portfolio to how much, um, what percentage of my portfolio do I allocate to crypto assets? And then the second question is how do I do that? And hopefully through this presentation, I can obviously point you in the right direction and give you some insight into how um, you can look to actually allocate. All right, so a quick look um, just for your benefit at the top 10 um, digital assets currently by our market cap. So we've got Bitcoin and Ethereum at the top, and those are probably names that you're familiar with. Uh, Bitcoin has been referred to as the digital gold in this space. Um, it's a store of value. It's the, the biggest um, blockchain by brand recognition. It's got the highest level of adoption. It really is the gold standard even to this day. Um, Ethereum then is um, the platform. It, um, with the most uh, you know, credibility and most adoption. And this can be seen as your digital oil. Um, and this is because you need the Ethereum token to operate in the Ethereum uh, environment. So you essentially have to burn um, this Ethereum token to, um, for any activity, similar to how you would need to burn oil to do traditional type of production. So what we see here is that you know, the, the infrastructure of the future is being built in the digital realm. So no longer are we looking at um, you know, the developing market story where um, you know, developing countries need roads and bridges and railways and ports and, and um, airports. Um, that was the old uh, world and the new world is all um, digital and it's infrastructure being, built, uh, being built in the digital space that uh, for me is the most exciting investment opportunity um, today. <clears throat> all right, so if you get to the point where you've, you say to yourself, 
um, yes, I want to allocate a percentage of my portfolio to this new asset class. And you start to scratch beneath the surface, you soon find out that um, there are thousands of digital assets um, available. And this can be very intimidating, uh, you know, especially for someone stepping into this asset class as, uh, for the first time. So you know, obviously, this is where we as an investment committee um, are looking to, to, to categorize the different uh, assets uh, into different compartments. Uh, similar to what you would do as an equity investor, and you'd look to have your, you know, your mining stocks and your tech stocks and your uh, uh, consumer stocks, et cetera, we, we're going to do something similar here. And hopefully, again, this will give you some better insight into um, the different types of projects uh, in the digital asset space. So first and foremost, store of value. As I've described, Bitcoin really stands uh, head and shoulders above any competitors in this space. Um, it's the only um, sector where I would say there's essentially a monopoly. Um, held by, by Bitcoin in this case. And you know, this is why, you know, as you'll see later, we would suggest looking to hold a core position in Bitcoin um, because it is the, the most recognizable um, and it's, it's still the gold standard. Then the second um, is a very, well, relatively simple concept to understand and, and that is uh, one of payments. So as uh, Nathaniel and Jevin spoke about earlier, the transaction of value through the digital space is um, is very cheap, very effective, and that has major implications for payments. So SWIFT is a very old technology. It's expensive, it's slow. Uh, its days are, are very much numbered. So projects like Ripple, Stellar, uh, Litecoin, um, all potentially offer uh, much better solutions from a payments perspective. Then the smart contracts. So you know, Jevin did a, a great job of, of um, uh, you know, highlighting some of the applications and, and some of the building blocks of, of that. But um, for me, from a, a simple, simple perspective, your smart contract platforms are essentially like an internet layer um, upon which other blockchain applications can operate. So similar to how your Google and Amazon and Facebook operate on top of the internet, um, your smart contract platforms essentially provide that, um, that layer for those um, different applications to operate on top of. So here we've got um, Ethereum, Solana, uh, Binance, Cardano, Avalanche, these are all um, platforms operating in the space and, and Ethereum for the first time um, you know, in the last 12 months has some serious competition and we're seeing this in the marketplace and it's been a very exciting place to invest um, of that. Then when speaking about decentralized finance, this is really pointing to many of these applications operating on top of this uh, layer. So we've got decentralized exchanges, we've got lending and borrowing protocols, uh, we've got synthetic protocols, which looks at tokenizing various assets uh, and derivatives. Um, so yeah, these are all um, very new um, technologies and, and, and relatively new services. Um, many of these will fail, um, but at the same time, amongst this section, we'll, you know, I, I think we expect to see some real market leaders um, of the future. Um, and you, you're obviously getting in very early still by allocating um, at this point in time. Then lastly, asset-backed tokens. So this is a, it's actually quite a big category. <clears throat> the one um, type of token I'm gonna to point to here is stable coins. So this is designed to um, be linked one-to-one uh, -one to the dollar, for example. So one uh, US dollar tether equals one um, US dollar. And this is a way that you can um, hold value in the digital asset space without having the volatility risk that crypto offers. Um, and then obviously NFTs is another asset-backed type of um, uh, token that Nathaniel touched on earlier. So it's really tokenization of, of value um, being held on the blockchain. All right, then the next section, I just want to take you through some of the analysis that one can do um, when looking to, you know, again, allocate capital in the space. And there are some very sophisticated methods that one can use. And you know, many people look at Bitcoin and say, well, look, there's no cash flow, um, there's no earnings. So how do we go about valuating this? And then it's written off just as uh, you know, casino money. But I hope to just give you some more insight into some of the sophisticated tools uh, one can use and apply um, when thinking about investment in this space. So firstly, on the left-hand side, you've got um, the stock to flow ratio. So the stock to flow ratio is a valuation model that looks at the amount of stock uh, in this case, Bitcoin that exists in the in the market, and then it looks at you know the rate of new flow um, coming in uh, as supply. So this uh, valuation metric has been applied to mining. 
So for example, gold mining, you've got an existing level of stock, and then you've got the miners um, bringing in new supply. And that, from that, you can draw up a valuation model. Now, obviously, with Bitcoin, we've got a decreasing rate of supply. So every four years, the rate of new supply is halved. And this has a deflationary impact on the price. And this is one of the main reasons that we've seen such uh, bullish price action. Uh, and this is a theme across digital assets. Typically, um, they are deflationary by nature. And you, co you correspond that to our traditional uh, fiat world where you've got this great proliferation of, of money supply. So this really is um, you know, turning finance on its head in the, in, in, the, um, in, in the way that these metrics are working. Um, so, yeah, this, the stock to flow model has been very uh, good in projecting uh, future price of Bitcoin and <clears throat> comparing the current price to the valuation model gives one an indication of whether Bitcoin is over undervalued at that point in time. <clears throat> then on the right hand side, um, you know, something to be aware of is the leverage ratio. So the derivative markets are very well developed in, in the crypto space. Um, and from time to time, there are very large amounts of um, open interest or leverage built up in the system, and that at some point needs to be released. So this is um, an important red flag to monitor, and this is, this is just one way that you can look to stay ahead of market movements, um, obviously looking for an edge uh, in investing in this space. Then on-chain analysis, so this is really unique to um, digital assets. So we've got tremendous insight into what's happening. It's a very data-rich um, investment environment where um, you know, every blockchain essentially is, is open source and one can get incredible insights into the activity and, and, um, uh, and what's happening on various blockchains. So obviously Bitcoin being the biggest one, we'll, we'll just focus on that. So on the left hand side, you can see a chart showing the uh, net inflows and well, the, the net flows to exchanges. So an exchange is obviously a place where you can buy and sell. If you've got large amounts of Bitcoin arriving on exchange, um, that's the most logical thing for to happen then is that for is, is for that Bitcoin to be sold. Uh, and vice versa, if there's large amounts of Bitcoin coming up, that relieves that selling pressure. So this is a way that again you can stay ahead of market movements by looking at the dynamics of what's happening on the actual exchanges. Then on the right hand side, you've got the mining um, outflow. So this gives you um, insight into the activity of the miners. So are the miners releasing additional supply? Uh, greater than the amount of uh, coins that they're being uh, are being produced, or are they holding their supply back? And obviously, the miners are integral in the in the Bitcoin ecosystem because that's where all your new uh, supply comes from. So their actions have um, you know, a very big impact on on price action. All right, then some insight into um, some of the software development happening on these projects. So GitHub is a repository where. Um, Software developers release their um, well, information about their code commits. And here one can take a look at you know, what number of code commits are being released, how many developers are assigned to specific projects, um, how you know, concentrated are those developers to um, those specific projects. And this really allows us to filter out um, uh, you know, the good apples from the bad, because obviously um, it's important that there's um, you know, good commitment from developers. Um, to various projects in order for them to be successful. All right, then looking at um, just some, some price action. So this for me is very important is to identify where you are in the market cycle. So, you know, as exciting as this technology is, <clears throat> and I'll, again, I'll go back to 2000 because that's something that we can all relate to. Um, well, at least those of us old enough <clears throat> um, is no one wanted to buy Amazon and, and Facebook Oh, not Facebook, <laughs> Amazon and Google at um, the peak of the dot-com bubble in 2000, as exciting as that technology is. And by the same token, you have to use some level of um, strategic asset allocation in this space uh, in order to be successful, uh, in my view. So it's good and important to be aware of where you are in the market cycle. And what you can see here is that the market cycle has been fairly predictable um, since back in 2012, which is as far back as this chart goes. And what I've highlighted here in the black is the halving. So that happens approximately every four years. Um, and we can see the market cycle and the price action uh, resonate around the halving period. So uh, you know, just to cut to the chase, where we are currently in this bull market cycle, in our view, is that we have the three-quarter mark. And what you can see historically is that your most bullish, most aggressive price action took place in the final quarter. So this is our expectation, is that we have the potential to see 
um, again, the most bullish and aggressive price action that we've seen so far uh, in this market cycle in the coming months, which um, again, you know, makes investment into the space um, very exciting at this point. And you know, if you've been following the news and the ETF announcements, et cetera, there's no doubt that there's you know, an incredible amount of um, anticipation and excitement and exuberance building up in this market. Um, obviously, we're looking to take advantage of that. But again, at some point, um, it's very likely that this market becomes overheated. And then one needs to look at um, you know, taking some profits and taking some risk off the table. All right. <clears throat> so let me just give you a practical, practical example about how one could look to build their portfolio uh, in this space. So um, our um, suggestion would be to look to hold a core position in Bitcoin, a secondary position in Ethereum, and then look to be selective about your altcoin selections. So uh, an altcoin is anything outside of, uh, outside of Bitcoin. Um, so these represent potentially your highest growth opportunities, but also are highly volatile. Um, so one, you know, obviously needs to be aware that you, from time to time, are holding a hot potato uh, in your allocation here. So for us, you know, we we very comfortable with looking at uh, a core, long-term Bitcoin Ethereum holding, but then being more nimble and um, uh, yeah, more strategic about your um, your altcoin allocations. And then one must also look to hold a percentage of um, cash or stablecoin as a be as a um, a risk neutral position. And then you know, obviously one can look to then weight uh, higher to your crypto exposure or higher to your um, your cash exposure, depending on your outlook uh, of the market. All right, so this really just highlights your, your capital growth um, opportunity here. So this is investing in the underlying asset and expecting it to increase in price over time. Um, then as Nathaniel um, and Jevin uh, pointed to, you know, there's now also the opportunity to generate yield. Um, and you know, how many times have we heard about the hunt for yield in traditional markets? Um, and for me, the bottom line is that uh, yields and interest rates have been suppressed um, by the central banks um, because they essentially um, determine what the interest rates are going to be. It's no longer really um, determined by supply and demand. So we are really going back to first principles in the technology and the services offered in the DeFi space um, by having the interest rate and the yield uh, return determined by supply and demand factors. Um, and as a consequence of that, you know, we can look at double digit uh, potential growth on, or at least potential returns uh, in the borrowing and lending space, which makes it a very attractive place um, to um, invest at relatively low risk without actual underlying crypto exposure, but benefiting from uh, essentially an interest or, or fixed income type of return. All right, and this is just a quick snapshot of looking at some of the different lending protocols, Compound, Aave, DYDX, Fulcrum. These are all names that I expect in time are going to become household names. Um, and as Nathaniel said, a real threat to the current banking uh, setup that we've got. Uh, and obviously, you've got your different assets and then the interest rates uh, on the various assets across the various protocols. All right, then arbitrage, uh, just to touch on pre uh, briefly. So in the digital asset space, um, you've got... Uh, hundreds of different exchanges, you've got thousands of different um, assets, and by virtue of that, from time to time, you have uh, price differentials between uh, one asset trading on one exchange at a low price and the same asset trading on another exchange at a higher price. And this obviously op um, presents an arbitrage opportunity. So you know, five years ago, this was an opportunity that you could actually take advantage of yourself manually in your, um, uh, in your pajamas at home, and executing it manually with your mouse. Yeah, so those days are, are largely um, behind us, but there are still opportunities from, um, if you're looking to execute um, through software algorithmically. And you know, this is where um, Avant Core and Arel technology have developed proprietary software to take advantage of these type of opportunities. All right, so putting it all together, um, you know, again, just to highlight and summarize your opportunities for investment in this space, um, from a capital growth perspective, Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, again, is your, your real, um, uh, your, your, your core assets, um, your most respected assets in the space that um, we believe that you should be looking to bank on um, in investing in digital assets. And then you've got the opportunity for, for more speculative investments in the altcoin space. Uh, and that obviously is looking at um, the capital growth side. 
Then on the yield side, you've got lending and borrowing, um, as well as arbitrage opportunities. So you know, we look to combine um, these different uh, elements into the Spectrum portfolio. Um, and obviously we are yeah, utilizing um, a diverse skill set um, across tech, across finance, uh, engineering, et cetera, to you know, make the best investment decisions um, with the information that's presented to us. And then, yeah, just to highlight, you know, very quickly, um, the performance of digital assets. So here we've got um, the price history. Had you invested $100,000 back in uh, January 2020? Firstly, you've got Bitcoin in, in gold, a crypto index in blue, and then you've got the Spectrum portfolio and its return over that period of time. So obviously, Bitcoin you know, and crypto assets have done exceptionally well, you know, up 590% and 700-odd percent, respectively. Um, but again, through the skill set that we have available um, in our team, we've been able to um, outperform that fairly significantly. All right, so yeah, if you do want to find out more um, about digital assets, I encourage you to, to have a look at our website. Um, let me take you there briefly. Um, we've got a number of videos of pa uh, past presentations recorded. So yeah, the first step to investment is education. Um, and you'll find, um, I think, some, some value by visiting our website. And we've, here's our recorded videos. We've got some content here, um, which I think is well worth having a look at. Um, and yeah, please, please um, go and check that out if you want to um, you know, find out more about investing in this space. So that's yeah, the end of my presentation. Thanks again, Bilal, um, and everyone for joining us. Thank you, Graham. Fantastic. I mean, it's exciting to see these returns. If you had just bought uh, Bitcoin, you're up about uh, more than 500% there, and then that uh, the portfolio has outperformed that at almost uh, almost a thousand percent for the period reported. So, really fantastic returns, and and interesting to see how you can generate returns from capital appreciation by allocating to what are now the blue chip cryptos, and then the second tier um, cryptos that are uh, and uh, and uh, that the, the, the crypto token universe is now also categorized as you would look at an equity, um, uh, an equity uh, board uh, where you have the mining sector and the cyclicals and the uh, financials. Um, in the crypto space, you've now started to see already this crunching of platform tokens and utility tokens and oracles and uh, decentralized exchanges. It's, it's amazing to see how fast this is all developing. And then on the other side, what you're talking about on the lending and the yield side are the, are the protocols where you are investing to what Nathaniel was explaining earlier, where you actually put your money into a protocol and you are becoming the bank. And the bank is then lending that into, into uh, you know, um, a borrowing protocol, which is, uh, which is financing somebody's house or Lombard loan. So it's beautiful to see how, how it all comes together and you end up in a, in a, in a world of uh, decentralized investment uh, that removes a lot of the need for people and uh, the you know trusted intermediaries. Um, so, so thank you for that, Graham. Pleasure. Cool. So, so lastly and most importantly, um, I'd like to welcome Rajiv from the EDB to share how Mauritius is welcoming and promoting the fintech industry here. Uh, Rajiv works as a lead professional at the financial services department where he's are responsible for promoting fintech in Mauritius with the investors who want to uh, come to this jurisdiction. Uh, for those who don't know already, the Economic Development Board of Mauritius is a governmental agency responsible for trade and investment promotion, as well as business facilitation. So basically, Rajiv is the guy uh, whose door, if you come and knock on, he will come and open all the other doors for you. Uh, and you can, come, you can come through the chamber with us and we have a very warm relationship with the EDB uh, to help promoting investment in Mauritius. Prior to joining the EDB, uh, Rajiv was an economic counselor of the Mauritius High Commission in Canberra, Australia. He also has experience as a financial advisor uh, in a derivatives futures exchange and as a bank officer in Mauritius. Um, we're doing a, a little bit over time for now, but uh, let's, uh, let's try to uh, let's try to go for 10 minutes and then from there uh, launch into the into the q and I see quite a few questions coming in and if anybody else uh, does want to share questions, please uh, do drop them into the chat. 
Uh, Rajiv, welcome, and please uh, share your presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction, Bilal. I'm just going to share my presentation. Perfect. I can see your screen. That's it. Beautiful. EDB always has the most beautiful slides. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be here on this uh, panel discussion. And I think we've had some interesting discussions so far from our panelists. So, um, so just a quick note on, on, on the EDB. We are, as Bilal mentioned, we are the government agency falling under the purview of the uh, Ministry of Finance. And we, we do help investors um, who are interested to invest in Mauritius. Um, in terms of strategic economic planning, we advise the government on relevant policies that needs to be implemented. Um, business facilitation, we ensure that projects are swiftly implemented. And we also do um, road shows for um, trade and investment promotion. Right now, as we are speaking, we do have a delegation um, of, I think, around 40 to 50 South African businesses who are currently in Mauritius. And um, myself, I'm responsible for promoting the Mauritius International Financial Center. And I look after the fintech sector and also I'm responsible for uh, promoting funds into Mauritius. So that's, that was about the EDB. Um, of course, we, we, as a developing country, we understand that the future is in digitalization and we're trying to position Mauritius as a fintech hub for Africa. We do believe that we have the right ecosystem to accompany companies, investors to test their innovative projects and expand into Africa. Uh, we all, we've all seen how the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced digitalizations, how uh, fintechs have uh, shaped um, the, the world of payments, money transfers. As Javon and Bilal right, rightly pointed out, today you don't have to go, to go to a bank for money transfers anymore. Blockchain technology allows individuals to transfer money uh, without going through the whole process of, you know, things like corresponding banks, etc. Not only it is much quicker, but also you're able to obtain better exchange rates. And of course, blockchain technology enhances that element of trust, which is very, very important when it comes to financial transactions. So, um, so why Africa? As we all know, Africa is the place to go when it comes to fintech and blockchain technology. Africa is home to one of the largest unbanked population. It is estimated that I think there are over 350 million people who do not have access to conventional bank accounts in Africa. Africa has a digitally uh, savvy population. Young people are not scared to use technology, especially when it comes to uh, banking. There is a drive in Africa to skip forward, to leapfrog, and there are more mobile money wallets in Africa than any other continent in the world. Of course, in fintech, uh, we've seen and uh, we've witnessed an unprecedented growth driven by an influx of foreign investors. Lots of VCs, angel investors are showing interest in Africa because of the opportunities that Africa presents. So why Mauritius uh, for Africa? Uh, we, I'm sorry, I'm just, um, just skip this slide. Yeah. So why Mauritius for Africa? The, uh, we, are, we are ranked uh, first in Africa in a number of international benchmarks. We do have strong uh, data protection laws. We have a strong pool of multilingual IT professionals, state-of-the-art technology platform with good connectivity. In fact, provisions for the deployment of 5G has already been made in the government program 2020-2024. And we believe that the launch of the 5G services is an important milestone in the development of uh, our government's vision to digitalize our economy. And of course, there are a number of advantages of using Mauritius. Uh, in terms of fiscal advantages and also the non-fiscal advantages as well. So I'll put these slides. This slide shows what are the regulatory developments that we have made um, related to, to enhance the fintech landscape in Mauritius. Um, the, FHE, the FSE, which is the regulator for the non-banking uh, activities, has, has launched a new license, which is the custodian of digital assets license. With this custodian services, 
digital access license, Mauritius becomes the first jurisdiction globally to provide a regulated environment for the custody of digital assets. And I think in June last year, um, the FSC issued the guidance notes um, on a common set of standards for security token offerings and the licensing of security token trading systems. So these new regulatory framework are sowing the seeds of the future for fintech and of course to improve the lives um, of individuals and also to build a more dynamic economy by embracing technology and innovation for creating future jobs. I've put this slide specifically in the context of um, this webinar. So um, I feel that this license would be more relevant uh, based on the context of, of, this, um, of this topic today. As I said, we were one of the first movers in Africa when we introduced this license. And it is also important to highlight that this license has been developed by the FSC after consultations with um, the OECD, which of course enhances the standing of this um, innovative license. And I also wish to draw your attention that this license conforms with the FATF recommendation 15. And uh, I would also like to inform that the government is also coming up with a new uh, virtual asset business bill 2021, which essentially is an integrated framework to include certain licenses into uh, legislation. And it will cater for different types of to token. And the objective of this bill is to provide the enabling framework for the regulation of VASPs and initial token offerings. Of course, it will cater for licensing, supervision, and monitoring of virtual asset service providers. This slide um, talks about the regulatory sandbox license, um, which essentially allows technology-based companies that do not fit into existing licensing frameworks and it will allow them to conduct their operations in a sort of control um, testing environment. And I think we were among the first um, countries in Africa to come up with such a, such a sandbox licensing uh, license. And I think up to now, 10 licenses have been granted covering uh, various aspects um, um, of the FinTech landscape, such as the initial coin offerings, cryptocurrencies, exchange platform, digital wallets, crowdfunding and many others. In this slide, um, I will talk a bit about the new measures that has been announced, especially in the recent budget speech. Uh, to promote innovation in the financial services sector, the government announced a number of initiatives in the, in the budget. As you can see, the, the Bank of Mauritius and the FSC will set up open labs for banking and payment solutions. An innovation lab will also be created to foster entrepreneurship culture. A single desk will be set up to accept all fintech related applications. And as I mentioned, a new legislation is, is, is being prepared uh, related to cryptocurrency trading and virtual assets. And it was also announced that the, the Bank of Mauritius will roll out a central bank digital currency. Um, the digital rupee, which will be on a pilot basis. And it is expected that this will be launched by the end of this year. So apart from the financial services sector, as you all know, Mauritius is mostly known as a tourist destination. It is a fantastic place to work, live and play. We have some of the best international schools um, present in Mauritius. And we have Curtin University from Australia, Middlesex from the UK, and a number of other international universities are present in Mauritius. In terms of play, we do have um, um, prestigious golf courses in, in Mauritius, which are highly ranked um, um, not only in Mauritius, but in the uh, Indian Ocean region. So I'm not going to go in all the technical aspects on the different types of occupational permit that we have, uh, that we have in Mauritius. But my message to you all today is, is we have a team at the EDB who looks after the occupational permit. And if you're interested to move to Mauritius, to work in Mauritius, to, to invest in a residential property in Mauritius, get in touch with us. We will advise you on the best, um, on the most appropriate visa scheme for you, depending on your specific circumstances. Uh, whether, as I said, if you want to retire, we do have certain schemes. But uh, also we have something that was recently introduced, which is the Innovators Occupational Permit, 
which is a new permit allowing um, investors, especially if you have a new project um, in this context uh, related to innovation and cryptocurrencies trading, so which, could, which you could be eligible for a tax holiday for a period of eight years. So on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this webinar today. Thanks a lot to Bilal and the other panelists as well. I think it's a very important subject that we are touching on today. We all have seen how the internet has changed uh, our lives. Um, in fact, we are able to intervene today thanks to the internet. And in the same way, blockchain will be shaping our future. So on that note, thanks a lot. Thank you, Bilal. Rajiv, fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's great to see the EDB uh, as the promotion arm of the Mauritian government supporting fintech. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't know that Mauritius was the first um, uh, country in the world to have the digital custody license, uh, which is it's, it's a huge achievement. And uh, I think Mauritius has been on the forefront of, uh, of regulation in, 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 in many spheres. Um, I, I'm also uh, appreciative of the security to uh, token offering and the digital asset marketplace coming. And well done on the 10 licenses that you mentioned have uh, been granted under the regulatory sandbox license. So, so we really are um, uh, doing our best to promote Mauritius as the hub of uh, FinTech into Africa. And, and uh, I mean, as Rajiv says, it's beautiful to, to uh, live, work and play in Mauritius. So you can see behind us, uh, all of us have got the beautiful iconic Coin de Mere uh, island, uh, which is one of our favorite spots to sail to in the north, and the water really is that color on a sunny day. So it really is a beautiful place to to live, work, and play, um, and especially with uh, some of the incentives uh, that uh, that Rajiv is is mentioning. Um, so, guys, um, we we are now at about ninety minutes in. Um, so I suggest what we do is let's kick off with the Q and A. We've got a few questions in the in the chat here, uh, and uh, and let's see how we go and uh, finish um, some of these questions. Let's go for another 15, 20 minutes uh, and see if there are any more questions. So let's start at the top here. Um, uh, Rajiv mentioned that Mauritius will have uh, the central bank digital currency coming through uh, by the end of the year. The Mauritian rupee and in pilot phase. Um, so the first question was, um, how, how, what is your view on how the introduction of CBDC will play out for, for the crypto market and the stable, co uh, stable coin market? Um, I think that is to some extent a ripple question as well. Um, so, so maybe if someone wants to take it uh, in terms of uh, how, how, how stable coins Link to Ripple and uh, if the ACC regulation is is in favor of it. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to... Oh, okay, Graham. Ripple boy. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to take it. Um, yes, I think what we've seen, um, the developments recently has been you know, more noise coming from the central banks about really you know, developing their own central bank digital currencies. Um, the next question is, you know, what type of infrastructure is going to be used for that? Um, Ripple has um, put up their hands. They've made no secret that that's the target market that they want to um, essentially tackle. Um, but I think it's going to be very interesting. And I, what I do expect is potentially a, a clash between central bank digital currencies and let's say um, you know, cryptocurrencies that we refer to in the form of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And how those two are going to obviously interact um, remains to be seen. It's going to come down a lot to how, you know, central banks want to introduce their new currencies, what form that's going to take. So there's still a lot of, a lot of question marks. Um, where that leaves stable coins you know, also is yet to be fully understood. Um, I, I do battle to see an environment where central banks um, who obviously want control over their CBDCs and want control over the money supply, et cetera, are going to um, allow stable coins to um, you know, continue to essentially operate in a regulatory free environment. So I guess more questions than answers. Um, but one particular um, thing just to point out from an investment point of view is that you know, if Ripple is adopted as the infrastructure for the central bank digital currencies, and that also makes uh, quite an, uh, an interesting investment case. So it's one way that you can essentially play both sides of the coin. So if you're backing your traditional uh, cryptocurrencies to be successful, then you know, buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, 
are the you know, most notable crypto assets. If you are backing uh, central bank digital currencies to be um, you know, at the forefront of this digital asset revolution, then Ripple uh, is, is one of the bets that you can look to take. So, and that's what we're looking to do from an investment point of view is, is essentially play uh, both, both sides of, of that potential development. Thank you, Graham. Natal, did you wanna do you wanna add something to that? Oh, I just wanted uh, to add that um, we see BDC using Ripple technology just rolled out about two weeks ago. So the central bank of Bhutan is actually the first one, but they're already moving to the uh, Ripple blockchain ledger. So I guess it's a good step in the right direction. If people are still doubting that central banks will be using blockchain and specifically like the block crypto assets for for building the tech stack, then this answers it. It's already here. And I think the next one in line is um, the Central Bank of England. Exciting, no, very interesting. So, so that, that would be Ripple replacing SWIFT as the, uh, as the correspondent bank between two, two yeah. as a start and a destination. Okay, very interesting. Okay, uh, let's look at the next question. Uh, okay, it's a bit of a controversial question. How does that, oh, my birds have started chirping here. Yeah? So for those that uh, know Mauritius, it's beautiful bird life as well. Um, uh, how does the tether story play out? Uh, is it a legit business? Um, who, have they done what it, uh, are they a legit business who have done what it takes to survive or are they just a blatant Ponzi scheme? Um, so, I mean, let's just trade carefully. We don't want to uh, get sued by Tether, yeah? But um, just uh, in your own, your own personal views of what, what this is about. <laughs> Who wants to catch the hot potato? <laughs> I, I'll catch it. Um, uh, from the investment perspective, uh, we are staying away from Tether as an asset, okay? So we are, we're staying away from this asset because they are risk. Not because the risk is real, but because sometimes fear moves market more than the real news. And because the fear is actually embedded in the system, so we're staying away from Tether. But if there's actually a problem with Tether, um, we've actually had a, 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 an event like this in 2019, 2017. And what happened is uh, all the all the investors, they sought refuge in, in Bitcoin, just like when there's a financial market crash, everybody seeks refuge in, in gold. So we are of the opinion that whether this plays out or not, it's very good to have a position in Bitcoin. And if this does play out, then there will be a run to safe haven, in which case our positions in Bitcoin will actually pay out. So we're not really market neutral on this side, but we have already well, we spent a lot of weeks analyzing what can happen and we're already mitigating that from an investment perspective. So I'm not gonna say whether it's a fraud or not, but I'm just saying no matter what this outcome is, uh, we're prepared. Yeah, so I think, I think what's objective to say is also that there's a lot of, there's a lot of news uh, around the, um, the accuracy of the valuation of Tether uh, and that they have been vague in disclosing the assets that are backing up the token. Uh, and I would say Tether looks like a lot like an investment bank where it takes deposits and then is able to, to buy commercial paper, uh, but doesn't really have to report to the investors on um, the full details of what exactly the duration and rating uh, and risk weight, all of that, um, uh, that, that commercial paper is. And if I just compare that to my experience in banking, uh, on the banking side, you now, uh, the recent IFRS, you now need to provision for the possibility of debts that could happen in the future um, based on statistical models and things, um, which, uh, you know, Tether doesn't really have to do that uh, while still having the benefit of being something like a bank. So, uh, yeah, from our investment perspective, we stay clear of Tether uh, in, 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 in the Spectrum portfolio. Um, Can I okay, just chip in there as well with yeah. a little bit more color? So, I mean, very briefly for those that are not aware, US dollar tether is a stable coin, which is designed to be one 
you know, valued at one to one to the dollar. Um, and it's minted by the company, in this case being Bitfinex, taking on dollars. So they take on a million dollars, they then print a million dollars of Tether and release that to that, um, that person who can then take that Tether and go and operate in the digital asset markets by Bitcoin uh, amongst, along with other assets, et cetera. So, and obviously the question now is, is that, uh, is the number of Tether in existence actually backed by the equivalent value uh, in the form of dollars or something else? And unfortunately, I guess, um, uh, but uh, but Phoenix haven't been transparent in communicating what the actual holdings are to back up those tokens. Um, so definitely it, there is a, a, a systemic risk of some nature without a doubt because Tether is very prevalent in the different uh, digital asset markets and exchanges. But I guess what I would point to now, which is important, is that there are many alternatives to Tether. So, so two or three years ago, Tether was essentially basically the only option that you had as a dollar-backed stablecoin. Now you've got USDC, you've got TrueUSD, you've got DAI, and a number of others. So I think the impact of a Tether collapse would be taken by the market far better today than it would have been um, a couple of years ago, which I think is important and reduces that systemic risk by the nature that you've got um, potential substitutes um, that can step into that um, position you know, if, if, um, if uh, Tether is uh, destabilized. Yeah, I think I think the stablecoin space has evolved uh, a fair amount since since um, Tether was the well since Tether was the only one and Tether still is the incumbent player, but uh, there's definitely an ability to now balance this out with the uh, with uh, other stablecoins as well. Um, cool. We got a question. I think this would be for Rajiv. Is there any custody or financial institution that currently holds a digital asset license in Mauritius? Yes, Bilal. Um, as I said, we do have, um, um, we're working on a new legislation, which would be the Virtual Assets um, Business Bill 2021. And it is currently under consultation and we're hoping that uh, it will be finalized by the end of this year. And I understand that this new leg legislation will, will integrate some of the existing licenses that the FSC already has in place, uh, including the audience services digital asset license. So, and it all depends on the specific types of um, cryptocurrency projects that an investor wants to do in Mauritius. It will depend on the characteristics, on the technical aspects. And um, from, from there on, it will, uh, the FSC will be able to, to, uh, to advise on what would be the uh, relevant uh, license that would be most appropriate. Cool. And, and I think what is also important, uh, Rajiv, is you mentioned in the presentation that all of these guidelines and uh, new regulations are drafted with effective uh, compliance. Uh, and that's very important for us uh, now with our uh, coming off the gray list and uh, you know, Mauritius moving back to the good jurisdiction that it is. Um, I, I think that will also now create a lot more interest when uh, we probably need to republicize these legislation uh, because a lot of people who were interested in looking at these licenses uh, I mean, if the question is, we have these licenses, why have they not been taken up? I think a big reason has been our, our issues on, on the gray list uh, would have stopped people coming into Mauritius. And now that we come off that list, uh, we now are fortunate to have the infrastructure in place to welcome these fintech uh, investment companies to Mauritius. So, so it's actually really opportune um, towards the end of this year to now be promoting this type of activity in Mauritius. Absolutely, Bilal. Um, as you rightly mentioned, the FATF welcomes Mauritius um, significant progress uh, that we've made in improving our AML CFT regime. And I think we have been able to address all the technical deficiencies that the FATF identified. Uh, I think it was in February last year. And uh, as you rightly said, you know, in October this year, we have been, uh, it has been concluded um, that uh, Mauritius would no longer be subject to increased monitoring by the FATF. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so so on on the topic also of the EDB and promoting investment into Mauritius, uh, one of the innovative uh, incentives was a uh, the various uh, tax benefits, uh, fiscal benefits 
there was an eight-year innovator innovation um, tax holiday scheme. Uh, on that front, Rajiv, can you tell us a bit more about some of the um, innovative schemes in Mauritius and how uh, how they've been taken up? Absolutely, Bilal. Yes. Um, in, in this year's budget, it was announced that um, we would introduce something what we call the investment certificate and it will be issued by the EDB. And essentially, what is the investment certificate? It allows um, companies which have innovative um, uh, innovative uh, projects or ideas, and uh, we would like to invite them to come to, to, um, to test the projects in Mauritius. Uh, but of course, that eight-year tax holiday is for uh, new companies, and there are certain uh, criteria that you need to respect. Not only you get an incentive of eight-year tax holiday, but you're also exempted from payment of registration duty and land transfer tax if you were to buy immovable properties uh, for business purposes in Mauritius. And you do get a lot of other incentives as well, um, such as you get a refund for the payment of VAT on PPE, et cetera. And uh, in the context of, 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 of this webinar, digital technology and innovation falls under the eligible sectors for that. So um, that's a bit about the investment certificate. So. If ever any, anyone would want more information on that, we're happy to assist further on how they can apply for this. Thank you, Rajiv. Very interesting. Um, okay, so a uh, question more back to the investment side. Uh, in terms of asset class distribution, what proportion of your total assets would you recommend as guidelines for individuals or institutions to hold in digital assets for medium or high risk tolerance? Who wants to take that question? I can take that. Um, so obviously, it's a very subjective um, answer, depending on one's uh, personal circumstances, their level of risk tolerance. Um, I mean, if you've got zero, then look at one. If you've got, if you've got one, then look at three. Um, but I would say anything between one and 10%, uh, potentially as a start, uh, is, is what I would suggest um, a person looks at. Um, yeah, but again, I think if you look at the different asset classes available for investment, there is nothing that's as exciting as digital assets. And I think the, the biggest crime you can make is not having an allocation um, to the space uh, despite the size. Yeah, so I think that's really the point. I mean, uh, 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 managing risk um, is all about diversification. Uh, and if you had 100% of your assets in property in uh, you know, a particular city and that city doesn't do very well, then you are still high risk because you, you're focused on a particular asset class in a particular place. Um, so, so what happens with, with an allocation to uh, a digital asset portfolio is you would have a, sm a, maybe a small allocation to something that's not correlated to the risk of the portfolio and that would reduce your overall uh, risk uh, from a correlation statistical. Um, perspective. So it's, I think it's all about right sizing and, and the right answer is discuss with your own finance advisor, financial advisor and figure out what is the right amount for you to invest. Uh, but I mean, it's, um, it's obviously not 100%, it's obviously not zero. Um, so, so you just need to figure that out um, with, with the guidance of your uh, financial advisor. Um, let me pick up one that maybe Jeff can handle because uh, I haven't been giving him anything. Uh, let's see, um, we've got questions here about uh, traceability. Um, uh, what does uh, Elliptic and CypherTrace do? Uh, how traceable is uh, cryptocurrency? Um, cryptocurrency has been used for illicit, or there are claims that cryptocurrency has been used for illicit activity. We know that you know, cash is used for a lot more illicit activity than, than crypto. Um, uh, what... Uh, how, how transparent is crypto um, and how do you uh, trace um, crypto in this public ledger where presumably all transactions should be visible? Sure. All right. So um, it's, it's quite funny that a lot of the initial discussions I had with people was around ability to launder money within the cryptocurrency space, but Cryptocurrency is actually very traceable. Um, it's a public blockchain and you're able to trace transactions 
around and let's say um, we found a fraudulent transaction and we wanted to trace where that came from, we can trace on the blockchain exactly where it went and someone would have taken that in or out of the current fiat system. And that has to happen somewhere. And often that would happen through an exchange, for example. So you would be able to pinpoint the exact exchange and then find out who that person was. Now, this is obviously just one example, but the traceability is there. There are, of course, cryptocurrencies that are designed to um, make things untraceable, things like uh, Monero. And those are what are the kind of cryptocurrencies that create uh, get a lot of regulatory heat. But cryptocurrencies like the uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, are highly traceable. And there are companies like Liptic and Software Trace that this is exactly what they do. And you find that exchanges employ the services of these companies to um, work out what risk is associated with any Bitcoin or any type of cryptocurrency that comes into the exchange. They will get a rating score and a report on that Bitcoin. So um, yes, yeah, it's, it's gone from this industry where everyone is worried about fraud and uh, terrorists using this money for, to to make payments um, to everyone realizing that there is a whole bunch of tools out here to actually provide all the traceability that we do need. Yeah, I, I think we'll move to a world where there'll be identified wallets and unidentified wallets. And once they I mean, all the identified wallets will create, you know, the ultimate surveillance global state where every transaction you ever do will be um, almost, uh, it, well, it will be fully traceable. And I think the applications for governments uh, and for management of um, large companies um, would be would be um, would be exciting to see how all the tax money gets collected into a particular wallet and how that tax money is then distributed to various departments and how all of that was actually spent. The 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 citizens of a particular country would be able to trace. I mean, besides just the money laundering and the problems we're dealing with uh, now, uh, there'd be full accountability to any, from any public organization or company back to the people who contributed that money because they'd be able to see exactly where that was spent. Um, do you see that kind of a thing happening, Jeff? Absolutely. And I, I think where it does help, uh, especially in the smart contract space, is that a lot of the applications on smart contracts need to do risk assessments on not necessarily just the cryptocurrency coming in, but the individuals or wallets that are associated with that cryptocurrency. So if I take it maybe back to insurance, what I was talking about is that we want to automate a lot of this process. And it's not just the automation of the business logic and the uh, or the claims process and getting that information in, but it's also the business logic around risk assessments of the individual and how do we work out what the premium is associated with that individual. We have access to all this information, all this public information. We have everything we need in order to automate that risk assessment process and, and again, drive further efficiencies into these processes. Huge. Um, okay, let's... let's, let's um... It's changed gear a little bit. We've got um, um, what will the effect of regulation be on crypto market prices in the future? And something similar around uh, um, in recent news, big banks are getting into crypto. Uh, I think also the SEC regulation on uh, uh, exchange traded funds. Uh, so, how will all of this affect crypto? I think we mean from from a from a market cap market price perspective, possibly which cryptos would be affected, and um, you know how does that affect from a technology perspective? Um, looking strictly from a market perspective, I mean most human beings are tend to abide by the laws. So if a government tells you like this thing is dangerous, this thing is bad, I mean apart from us rebels. We just kind of do whatever we want to do. Uh, most people tend to abide and say, you know what, I'm not going to touch that if, if a government tells me it's bad. Just, just to caveat that, Nathaniel, you abide by all the regulations and laws. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm in Mauritius, so this is illegal, but I'm, I'm take, talking about um, cases like in China where this is, damned, uh, this is deemed illegal to hold crypto, uh, to, to buy and trade crypto. So 
if we have regulation, this is going to be a green light for, for people who are defensive to say, you know what? Okay, I believe in my government, they actually sanction the law is here to protect me. So I'm gonna go in. I mean, this is what we've seen with um, ETF. I mean, just the launch of an ETF, which was not even a spot ETF, it was a, a derivative back ETF, launched BTC for price from like uh, 47 to 66,000. Dollars. And we're talking about like uh, half a trillion being added in market cap in the span of like two to three weeks. So if tomorrow all the governments of the European Union would say like, okay, crypto is legal tender, you know, you can use it as any form of asset, everything we accept. I think we're looking at one zero or even one zero in the span of a few months behind the market capitalization. So as long as you're holding crypto, it doesn't matter which one you're holding, it will all go up. Of course, there will be like winners and, and, and losers. But if you're well diversified enough, I mean, rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, at the same time uh, in the crypto <coughs> markets, um, there are some boats which are which are with big holes in them. So, so the water when the water, <laughs> when the water rises, some of those boats will sink. So you do have to be a little bit careful around uh, some of these stories. Uh, but but I agree with you greatly that um, now that the SEC as a global lead regulator has um, put a stamp on a, on a Bitcoin ETF, although it's a, a derivative based ETF, not a, not a spot or physical backed ETF. Um, it does then open the door for all the other regulators to, to follow suit. Um, and I think it doesn't really matter whether it's a spot or derivative ETF because um, effectively, even if there's a derivative, there is some derivative prime broker somewhere that is writing a long uh, Bitcoin position that has to buy the actual physical Bitcoin to hedge their position. So, yeah. so, so it's definitely still getting back into the into the crypto markets. And uh, I saw a presentation on Bloomberg uh, with Larry Fink from BlackRock, where he said, "Listen, uh, crypto is not a big thing because they're only going to invest one or two percent of their portfolios." into this kind of asset class and that's coming from, still alive uh it was a few months ago i haven't oh. i don't know if he, 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 it must be like what 90 something yeah. <laughs> maybe he's like suspended uh, i remember him and uh yeah so i mean if if, if it's a if it's one or two percent of the trillions that blackrock manages um <coughs> that that one asset manager alone uh will make a big dent uh in in in, in the potential supply of uh, of major cryptos um, Can I chip okay. in a little below? Um, so just briefly, my, I mean, my views, I mean, it's very interesting to see how regulators are responding. I and mean, we see the US and the West um, being you know, largely accommodative uh, recently, and that's um, shown by the recent ETF launch. And then China, as an example, has been restrictive. So, you know, what impact does regulation play? Well, it, it, it obviously depends on what type of regulation is being brought forward. But um, that said, um, I think any, and obviously impact, you know, regulation has a big impact on the price, but for me, it's, it's short term. Uh, in my view, no regulation can kill Bitcoin and can kill crypto. And we've seen that firsthand in the, the um, case of China. And Nathaniel, you'll be closer to the action than us, but um, my understanding is that you know, the, the regulation uh, there in China has done very little to curtail the adoption and the, you know, the, the, the the role that crypto is playing in that space. And I think this is a, a difficult position for regulators, especially if they want to take a strong stance, is that it, um, there is no off button. There is no uh, central address that they can go and visit the CEO and say, you know, we're going we're gonna to put you in handcuffs if you don't uh, stop what you're doing. And this is the, the nature and, and the full power of uh, blockchain uh, technology and cryptocurrency is that um, it is decentralized. It is, you know, almost democracy in action and it, it cannot be, uh, stopped by by regulators. Um, yes, they can put short term roadblocks in front of it, but uh, there's no regulator uh, walking around with um, you know a big sickle uh, ready to chop Bitcoin's head off because it doesn't exist. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. And uh, I think I think uh, there's a slight difference in a uh, concept like Bitcoin and then a concept like Ripple because Ripple did have the head office that that has something to point at. So we have to look at. Uh, each cryptocurrency individually, and I fully agree on the Bitcoin front uh, with what Graham is saying. Um, 
And then from the mainstream, you've got uh, people like uh, Scott Maynard from Guggenheim. Uh, you've got uh, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest, uh, Mike Novogratz, uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the micro strategy um, and, and uh, Elon Musk from the Tesla side, um, all now believing and allocating to this digital asset space. So there's, there is a potential that maybe Elon Musk one day uses one of these coins to be the currency to pay for your global internet Starlink. Um, and uh, that starts the first, the first completely independent global currency running through the blockchain. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's quite, quite a far way uh, as a concept. Uh, but I think there's a lot of concrete stuff we can see right in front of us. So uh, guys, there are a few questions in the chat here. I'm going to pick one more. And then if you guys, anybody wants to pick a question that they do want to ask or, or answer, we can, we can handle that. Um, and then what we'll try and do is round up in the next five minutes here. I'll just pick one more question. I think this one's probably for Jeff. Uh, a question regarding the impact of future advancements in quantum computing on the underlying blockchain cryptography. Does exponentially, exponentially faster computational ability affect cryptography strength and reliability? So, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the hacklessness the, or, or the strength of the blockchain is only really uh, as strong as whoever's trying to attack it is, is I think, the question here. Um, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, cool. Happy to, to take that one. Um, I enjoy this one because uh, before actually getting into blockchain, I took quite an interest in cryptography. So there's an interesting history around cryptography that is going on actually for thousands of years. There's to and fro between us trying to encrypt things and people trying to hack that encryption. Started off with me and you deciding that, okay, well, instead of me just sending you a normal letter, when I send you something, I'm gonna move the letter just one over. And you know that that's just how you're going to decrypt it. And so that process slowly became more and more complicated um, so that people would be able to decrypt it. Um, but the inherent issue with that is that we would have to, you would have to know that route, that way to decrypt it. So at some point I would need to send you that message to say, this is how you go about decrypting it. Um, and so these, these models became more and more complicated into you know, World War when we had the Enigma. And then there was this breakthrough of this private first and public key mechanism, which was a Massive breakthrough for, for encryption. But the, the story really is that there's there's encryptors and people trying to innovate here. And this the these investments in trying to break that decryption that keeps following it. And it's that advancement that uh, that keeps following it that drives the innovation on the other side. So when it comes around to this quantum computing, and I, I do think that often there is a misconception around how it works um but i mean I'm, I'm i'm very pro the technology but we're not going to see within the next year or so quantum computing at a point where it's able to go public and just stop breaking keys um we're well away from that i believe um however we we've got a plan for it for it coming um and we were if if the question here is to worry about how it's going to impact uh, bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency I think we actually just need to look broader than that. Um, if it has the potential to break cryptocurrency, it has the potential to break a significant amount of cryptography mechanisms used throughout the world for a lot, a lot of things. So there is significant incentive around the world to advance crypto cryptography um, to ensure that that is not the case. So the incentive just isn't around cryptocurrency. So. Uh, with that incentive, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we'll be able to just keep continuing to make advances in cryptography um, to be able to mitigate the risk of quantum computing on it. And with blockchains, you, there is route to uh, upgrade things. Things are fairly modular. And at some point, we are able to upgrade the encryption mechanism that is used for us. And I believe that that will come. I mean, right now, actually, we do have methods to improve the encryption um, required uh, on blockchain. We just don't need it right now. It's a great answer. And, and I think uh, you're right, Kevin. If, if, um, if 
quantum computing is able to hack the blockchain protocol of whichever Ethereum um, crypto, uh, we would have a much bigger problem in terms of um, other defenses being hacked as well. Uh, so, so um, yeah, I mean, but but it is a concern, and, and you're right, it does. Uh, it's a to and fro between between the two. Um, okay, our last question. Uh, I think this one is from Elijah Jen. And uh, Elijah, nice. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good good to, to to hear from you again. Uh, his question is: Has Stewards created any new crypto products outside of the arbitrage product? Uh, Probably for Graham, my bell is going, yeah. That's, that's the bell. Cool. Uh, just to reiterate, the, <laughs> the question is, does Stuart have um, other product offerings outside of the arbitrage offerings? Is that correct? Cool. So, yes, I'm very excited to um, tell you that uh, Spectrum um, Digital Asset Portfolio is the, the newest product in the Stuart suite. So we've been uh, testing this strategy within a, a portfolio since... Uh, January 2020. Um, it's been live in Mauritius for how long now, Bilal? Uh, well, almost a year. Almost a year. Yeah, but, um, yeah, we're really in a position now where we're looking to ramp up um, the marketing and the, uh, the awareness of the, of the product um, now that we've really got uh, all the systems in place. And yeah, yeah very exciting market conditions to be um, speaking about this product and, and looking to take on investment with the the level of interest that we've got in digital assets as a whole. And I think it's, an, it's a great opportunity for um, individuals now to look to hold um, value in this, in this space, um, have regulated, um, uh, experienced investment managers with the expertise that we do have at our disposal, um, making investment decisions on their behalf uh, in the same way that we're all used to that in terms of mutual funds and unit trusts, um, et cetera. And um, obviously, you have it in a regulated space. So no longer are you having to do everything yourself, hold it in a, a wallet or you know, look to hold it on exchange. And you know, we've, uh, you, you know, we've, we've obviously got business uh, leaders and entrepreneurs on, on the call here who don't have time to watch their crypto portfolios and would rather outsource that um, to you know, a team of professionals like ourselves. And obviously, we've got the right investment structures now to obviously handle that. And Mauritius has been a great jurisdiction to be able to have access to because of the regulatory environment that's being created. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, I mean, very exciting. I mean, Spectrum is a great, great performing investment. I mean, uh, Graham shared earlier the returns of Spectrum, which is effectively a crypto-centric hedge fund. Um, so that, I mean, which has done almost 1,000% uh, return for the last year. So yeah, very interesting, Elijah, and yeah, please come check it out. Very, very welcome. Okay, guys, so thank you very much. Uh, let me round up with just some general chamber announcements. Um, the video will be posted on our Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and on the chamber website uh, for anybody who wants to access it or miss anything. Um, we also just uh, update from the recent AGM. Uh, we are proud to welcome to the board of the SA Chamber of Commerce now officially, uh, Grant Parsons, CEO of Investec Mauritius, and Laura Vorden as his uh, uh, second um, from the uh, from Investec. And then from Sunlam, we have uh, Gail Vishen and Mark Muller joining the board. Uh, and we also welcome to the board uh, Priscilla Balgobin from Dentons. I'd also like to take an opportunity quickly to thank the members for my re-election re as president of the chamber and my vice president, Sean Thompson, uh, also for his ongoing support. Um, our incoming treasurer for the year is Sin Lee um, of uh, Baker Tilly, uh, and our vice treasurer is uh, John Mack from Airtech Aviation. Uh, Captain's done a great job on the chamber building the uh, new website you will notice that there is now a login portal uh, section. Uh, so you must register and then you'll get access to the members only section of the portal. Uh, we'll also be launching some uh, editorial content via blog, uh, which will be led by the editorial committee um, uh, uh, headed up by Mike Gray. Uh, Mike Gray is also uh, busy establishing the off-island chapters of the SA Chamber of Commerce to help us get um, 
get our voice to South Africans uh, who want uh, to make an investment in Mauritius, who are based in uh, South Africa, the UK, or even Singapore as a start. Uh, regarding physical events, uh, the board has taken a decision to wait until uh, next year uh, to, to assess when would be the best time for us to actually kick off our large physical events and getting back to the La Bordene. Um, and uh, the gala event uh, for the end of the year has been postponed to, to next year as well, which would be our chamber gala event and, uh, and awards evening. Um, and then lastly, thank you very much for your time and uh, attention. It's been a pleasure to share with you more about uh, this exciting new space. Uh, and I welcome uh, all the viewers to share this uh, presentation uh, and also share news about the South African Chamber of Commerce. We welcome membership into the SA Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you'll see here um, all the uh, email addresses if you wish to get in touch with any of the speakers uh, and uh, the websites. Um, and also, um, uh, you can also come onto the Chamber website and um, click the Apply Now button um, to find out more information about joining the Chamber in Mauritius, and then we can help you plug into the EDB and uh, promote this fintech industry uh, in our environment. So uh, thank you very much to our speakers for your insights uh, and taking the time out of your busy day to do this. So thank you, Nathaniel, uh, Graham, thank you, Jevin, and thank you very much, Rajiv, and um, uh, thank you, Catherine and Aro, for uh, arranging everything.